little bit. Because what James is saying, let's read it again, verse 1. He says, what is the source? What is one of the, the, the things that is fueling your quarrels and your conflicts in your friendships, in your working relationships, in your family, in your marriage? He goes, isn't one of the sources your wrong expectations, your non-biblical expectations, your desires, your pleasures? Verse 2, he says, for instance, he gives one example, you're envious. And you can't have the thing that you're envious for. You see what other people have. You see the quality of relationship they have, or you see the status they have, or the honor they have, or the gifting they have, or the position in life they have. And you go, hey, I want to have that as well, though we look at others to imitate their dedication to the Lord. But we're not to look at others and determine that what they have is what we're going to have no matter what. He says, when you do that, what happens, you don't, it doesn't ha you don't get it the way that you're imagining it, then you quarrel and fight, and you have conflict in your marriage, you have conflict in your family, et cetera, et cetera. So paragraph A, I'm going to continue reading. James pointed out that a significant source of our relational conflicts, and even some of the anguish and the pain and bitterness we feel, he says, one of the sources is our own desires and expectations that are outside of the will of God that we have not defined as being outside of the will of God. We just assume they're normal and we assume they're something we should insist on. And he says, and those are creating some of your anguish in your heart. It's a very uh, uh, searching scripture. James chapter 3 is and James chapter 4. Paragraph B, the whole story of someone's bitterness, the whole story of their emotional pain, and bitterness and emotional pain don't always have to be the same, includes how we are mistreated, but also how we respond to the mistreatment. The whole story of somebody being bitter is not just they were mistreated, but it's how they responded to the mistreatment. The two together form the greater storyline. Well, let me restate it a different way, paragraph one. There is an enemy on the outside. There's the, the person that mistreats you, the injustice that's done towards you. Then number two, there's the enemy on the inside, and that's what James focuses on in this passage. It's our response to the mistreatment. And he identifies, we'll see in, ver in chapter 3, verse 14, we'll get there in a minute, that envy and self-seeking are one of the primary sources of the conflict and even the turmoil we feel in the conflict. It's not only the injustice done against us, but it's our response to the injustice. Paragraph 3, the Bible makes it clear. We are both victims and we are agents of our own offense and wounding. We're offended by a situation. We're wounded by a situation. We are victims in the sense we were really mistreated. It's real. They really should not have done the things that they did. But we're agents. In other words, we're, uh, we're, we're helping the wound go forward by responding wrongly. We allow the injustice done against us to escalate into a festering wound of bitterness. One of the premises of, uh, uh, of, of the Scripture is this that an injustice done against us doesn't produce bitterness in us. The injustice itself doesn't produce the bitterness, but rather it's the wrong response to the injustice that allows the bitterness to happen. Now, we can have pain when somebody mistreats us, but bitterness doesn't set in until we respond wrong to it. Paragraph 4, nobody can make us bitter by what they do. We only become bitter by how we respond, by responding wrongly to what they do. And my point uh, in, in this of the four-part series, I, I'm just, I talked on this a bit on the third part, but when we're tempted with bitterness, often our focus is on forgiving the person who mistreated us. So people come forward and they receive prayer and they commit to forgive the person that mistreated us. That's completely biblical. But here in James chapter 3, uh, James is going a different direction. He's saying, in addition to forgiving the people that mistreated you, he's approaching it in a different way, not at all undermining the truth of the need of forgiving the people that mistreat us. But he tells us here, he says, uh, focus on the enemy within, not just the enemy without. 
Don't just focus on the forgiving the mistreatment. Deal with the negative emotions that you have that contributed to the conflict initially, but even contributed to the anguish you had in the midst of the context. I mean, of the conflict. Top of page two. In this passage, James three. And again, you could read the passage a, a bit on your own and just kind of get more familiar with it if you're not familiar with it. Paragraph C, just to kind of give you a summary of, of, of the passage we're looking at, James pointed out two main causes to relational conflict. He, the two causes are envy and self-seeking. Envy and self-seeking of the person that mistreated you and envy and self-seeking in the person that got mistreated. Envy and self-seeking in both parties in different applications, different measures, different expressions, but the envy and the self-seeking on the enemy the outside of the person coming against you, but the enemy on the inside, our own envy and self-seeking that's responding in a wrong way. Then the next thing that James does in this passage he contrasts two types of wisdom. He calls it wisdom, the heavenly wisdom and the earthly wisdom. And instead of the word wisdom, you could put two different perspectives of the conflict. He's saying, if you look at the conflict from a heavenly perspective, you're going to respond differently than if you look at it from an earthly perspective. Now, the problem today is that the, that the wisdom that comes from our culture is very different than the wisdom that's in the kingdom of God. But the wisdom or the expectations or the way that we view conflict, the way our culture teaches us to do it, very different from how the kingdom does. But the two merge together in the church. They're not supposed to, but they, they, it's pretty easy for that to happen. And we end up responding uh, out of the values and perspective of our culture, we respond to conflict, and we think we're doing the Bible thing. And the Bible, and, the, and James is saying, that's not the wisdom from heaven. That's not the kingdom response. That's not the kingdom perspective. You got that from the world. You got that from your culture. Those expectations were not at all the expectations the Word of God set forth for your life. Those were ones that you picked up naturally out of the culture. So he, con he contrasts the two different perspectives of the conflict. Two different perspectives of how we're to respond. Well, let's read it real quickly. Verse 14, James 3. He goes, if you have bitter envy, if you have uh, self-seeking in your hearts, he says, don't boast and lie against the truth. He says, don't imagine you're beyond it and you lie to yourself about the presence of envy and self-seeking in your heart. He goes, if you see none, you're boasting, you you esteem yourself too highly. He says, in another translation, he says, you're arrogant. You're not walking in the truth about what's in your heart. But rather, lie against the truth and minimize that. He goes, own it fully, and that will be the pathway to your own freedom in your heart, and it will be the beginning of the restoration of that, of that relationship. He says in verse 15, this perspective that refuses to acknowledge uh, wrong emotions in our own heart. This perspective, this wisdom doesn't come from heaven. This isn't the biblical perspective. He goes, this is the earthly perspective. Verse 16. He goes, but there's no, there's no benefit in denying the truth or in rationalizing the truth or minimizing the truth about your own envy and your own uh, self-seeking. He goes, verse 16, because wherever they exist, even a residue, wherever it exists, even a small measure in a mature believer, there will be confusion. There will be confusion in the relationship, and there will be confusion in our hearts. And the confusion means the opposite of God's order, which is peace and love and humility. He goes, you'll have the opposite of love and peace in your heart. And he goes, if you don't own these things, you'll end up staying in confusion in your own emotions. And that confusion, again, is the opposite of God's order. It means turmoil, anxiety because of what's happening in the relationship above and beyond what it needed to be. Now, there's always a little pain. There's always some pain in a relationship when there's stress in it. But, but because we're not owning our part of it, we, then the, the confusion in us actually is, is escalates and it goes to another measure. And all we can see is they mistreated us, and that's the end of the story. 
And the Holy Spirit saying, no, you can actually minimize some of that confusion in the relationship and even in your own emotions if you would own what I'm saying to you here. Uh, James the Apostle would be teaching the early church these things. Paragraph D. Well, again, instead of the word desires causing our conflict, I'm going to use the word unfulfilled expectation. Those are the same things as desires. The unfu- we, the, we all have unfulfilled expectations. Some of those expectations are godly expectations, and they will be fulfilled in God's time and God's way, and there's a challenge in waiting for that. But we have a, no- a whole other set of expectations that are not in the will of God. They're expectations, again, that we gain from our culture, but they're not in the, in, in, in the Word of God. We fight for them, but the Bible says fight for humility in your own heart and fight to grow in a servant spirit. That's what you should be contending for. You're contending for things just to be easier and you to have more comfort and more honor, and the Holy Spirit's contending for you and I to grow in humility and in servant heart. I mean, there's two different agendas entirely. I mean, we're all the same in this. The Holy Spirit knows that humility in a servant heart, which the Bible calls the greatest things, both of them are called the greatest, along, they are expressions of love. Humility in a servant heart is another word for love. I mean, it's an expression of love. Beloved, when you and I die and we stand before the Lord, all that we're going to bring with us is love or humility and servanthood. So in my marriage, in my relationships, in friendships, working relationships. I want things to be easy and things to go well. The Lord wants me to grow in humility and servanthood. I'm going, yeah, I'll do that next week, next month. I'm going to get around to that. I really am, Lord. And the Lord says, well, no, no, my agenda and your agenda are different. You want things easy. I want you growing in humility. Because when you stand before the Lord on the last day, the only thing you'll bring with you on that day is humility and servanthood or love, whatever you want to call it. We're not going to bring our testimony of an easy life. We're going to bring love. And so we would rather put off growing in humility, but the Holy Spirit says, no, you really don't. You only think you want to put that off because you'll have that forever if you grow in it. You will carry that with you to the age to come. So we look at relationships. We want more out of those relationships than we're getting. But the Lord wants us to grow in love and humility. We go, yeah, we know, Lord, but later, we'll lock into that later. We really will. We want more of these other things right now. And again, some of those things are godly expectations. Others are expectations from our culture, from the, rom- from, from the romance novels. And, and we don't always know which or which. And so James says, ask the Holy Spirit to search your heart. Be a man of the Spirit. Be a woman of the Spirit, a woman of the kingdom, and respond to the conflict a biblical way, and you will find liberty in your heart, and you'll find healthy relationships will begin to grow and, and be uh, cultivated in a far uh, greater measure. 